Okay, hello everyone and uh, welcome to today's uh, webinar on building trust in the scientific evidence base supporting chemical risk assessment and the role of the adverse outcome pathway framework. This uh, webinar is uh, co-organized with the European Commission Joint Research Center and hosted by the OECD Environment Health and Safety Division of the Environment Directorate. I am Magda Sahana, I'm administrator to the Adverse Outcome Pathway Program. And uh, before we go uh, further, I would like to emphasize that uh, your active participation is important throughout the session. During the presentations, we'll be hangi, uh, managing the, this uh, Q&A uh, feature found in the lower banner. Uh, you can enter your questions and comments in this Q&A box uh, or after uh, its uh, presentation or during the presentation. And please indicate uh, for who are the question uh, to be addressed. Uh, it can be uh, to a certain panelist or all of the or all of the panelists. So we will provide answers during the Q and A session at the end of uh, of the presentations of all presentations. And um, please use the chat function. Uh, only if you have any technical issues. And from our side, we'll use it uh, uh, also to disseminate some uh, uh, useful information. As you have noticed, the webinar is uh, recorded and will be made uh, uh, available together uh, with the slides on our webpage. The motivation behind uh, uh, today's webinar that, uh, as I've mentioned already, is on building trust in the scientific evidence base supporting chemical uh, risk assessment and the role of AOP framework. It was this uh, recently published report from the JRC on addressing evidence needs in chemical policy and regulation. This report is uh, the um, is the culmination of the um, of the AOP framework study that you can see uh, on your right that aim to get insights into stakeholders' perception of the main uh, challenges uh, uh, facing in chemicals regulation, on alternative approaches to conducting toxicological testing, and also on the role and added value of the AOP framework. So join me welcoming together one of the main authors of the report and of the full study, Anna Maria Caruzzi from Interchange uh, Research. Uh, she will talk about trust and transparency plus in chemicals regulation. After this, we'll hear about how to build trust through improved tools and uh, practice in the life cycle of mechanistic uh, data from Antonio Franco, uh, who is affiliated at the European Commission uh, Joint Research Center. Uh, following that, uh, Jason O'Brien from, uh, uh, from the Environment and Climate Change Canada uh, will present the role of the AOP framework in knowledge management and trust uh, building. And we will close today's webinar with a Q&A session that Clemens uh, Whitwer uh, from uh, the European uh, Commission Joint Research Center will help me to moderate. So as you can see, we have a very busy agenda and it's better to get uh, started. So I will hand it over to Anna uh, Maria Caruzzi for the first presentation. So thank you very much. It's over to you, Anna Maria. Thank you, uh, Magda. I'll just um, share my screen. <clears throat> right, okay. I hope everyone can see my screen. Um, so I don't think anyone can argue with the claim that there's a clear need for effective chemicals regulation in view of the massive effect that chemicals have 
on all aspects of our lives, but also because it is core to uh, our sustainability strategies, looking to the future with the kind of um, uh, environmental concerns that we have. And that's recognized in, for example, the European Commission's chemical strategy uh, for sustainability and similar strategies around the globe. Um, and issues um, arising from chemicals are increasingly um, in the news, and there is a growing public awareness of all the issues that are coming from, uh, from chemicals, um, as is evidenced in this quite random collection of, um, of headlines that I've gathered together here. Um, so the, our question might be, do toxicologists and re regulators need to do things differently? And if so, what? Um, the study I'm going to talk about suggests that the answer to the first question is a resounding yes. And we'll go on to make some broad suggestions as to what might be done differently. Um, and the two next speakers will give some more concrete examples. So firstly, I'll say a little bit about myself. Um, I'm neither a regulator nor a toxicologist, so it might be quite odd that I'm addressing you. <laughs> um, the kind of science that I do is the science of science. That is, I do research on the processes of science using a combination of philosophy of science uh, that gives me a basis in the theory of scientific knowledge and um, social science techniques for empirical studies and observations of scientists at work. In 2019, I was commissioned by the JRC Unit for Chemical Safety and Alternative Methods to conduct what was then titled a retrospective and prospective analysis of the Adverse Outcome Pathways Framework, with particular focus on the AOP knowledge users. Earlier studies had focused on developers of the AOPs, mostly academics and other scientists. But the aim of this study was to get a better understanding of how the AOP framework could better serve key stakeholder groups. And these were identified as six main groups. That is regulator, regulatory toxicologists, risk assessors, and risk managers in industry and in governance. Um, so this new study focused on how to make the AOP knowledge more usable for making regulatory decisions by these stakeholder groups. The final report of this research was finally titled Addressing Evidence Needs in Chemicals Policy and, Re and Regulation. But the rec recommendation of this report um, are based on the study findings presented in this earlier report, the Adverse Outcome Pathway Framework path, um, Study Report. The bulk of this study was conducted through a survey, through individual interviews with a broad array of people representing the different stakeholder groups, and through group interviews or conducted as, as focus groups in various settings, sometimes at, com at um, chemicals-based conferences. The data were analyzed for emerging themes, and all of the details of the study you will find in this, um, this earlier report, the study report. So today I'm just going to um, highlight just some very small snippets of it, but it is the basis of the recommendation report. And the first thing we found on an initial reconnaissance of the domain is that the challenges that we thought were specific to the AOP framework were very much more widespread. And we needed to refocus the study on what were the main challenges facing the stakeholder groups in general and not only with respect to their actual or potential use of the AOP framework. And this is seen in the shift in title, indeed, between um, as, as the, 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 the study progressed. Um, <clears throat> so first I'll talk about these challenges, and then I'll move on to the notion of transparency plus that is at the heart of our recommendations for chemicals regulation going forward. So the first of these challenges is that there's a lack of consensus on the different methods and approaches in toxicological sciences, which is made worse by the difficulty of access to large quantities of dispersed and non-standardized data. 
Um, so we know that there's a plethora of methods and forms of data in toxicology and toxicity studies. There are the familiar animal studies, which have long been considered to be the gold standard, standard of toxicity st studies. And there are many other methods at different stages of being currently used, new and emerging. And here are a couple of a few quotes from the study, for participants in the study, um, talking about these issues. And the first quote is by a participant who was saying, we're finding out that the in vivo, in vivo studies are not so gold. They're not really the gold standard that we ought to be retreating to because they themselves have their own limitations. But then an opposing view has been expressed by the next participant. Industry puts a lot of effort in these alternative tests to avoid expensive animal testing. But at the same time, industry makes sure that alternative testing is insensitive, non-validated and biased. The public will be even more a guinea pig. And it's important here to see that um, the same range of disagreement could be found e among participants, even in governance and in industry. So for example, there were people in industry, participants from industry who were adamant that animal st studies are indeed the gold standard and others instead expressing ex frustration that regulators continue to insist on them. So the views really cut across all of the sectors. Um, the, next the next challenge, oh, I'm not <laughs> finding work right there. And the next challenge is this, this pervasive mistrust that we've already seen in the previous quotes a kind of a hint of that mistrust there. There's a pervasive mistrust among the different stakeholder, um, stakeholders in all the different sectors between industry and governance and between the different roles as well. Um, and here are a few quotes that, um, that demonstrate this mistrust. Uh, the first uh, one participant said, regulators want more data to meet targets of their own for their own searches. They make exaggerated demands on data. These demands are tailored to what the authorities want to do with all these data, going beyond the regulatory needs. Another participant uh, expressed this view. I think there is too much politics and too much interest in it. And sometimes that can happen, of course. I think that the endocrine disruptor issue that we just came from there, it's a good example of it because there is not really a scientific base for the decisions that are being made. And that's a concern to me. And another, a third participant um, said this, opinions and decisions are under control of a few individuals per chemical due to a number of reasons, which cause a feeling of intransparency and excessive political controls over clearly scientific subjects. So while a well-informed skepticism is certainly a highly valuable attribute among scientists and consumers of science alike, there is also a level of mistrust that is simply um, not very productive and counterproductive. The third challenge that we identified is that the decisions, um, that science directly informing policy and regulatory decision-making often lags behind current science. So here are some of the quotes that illustrate this. The, the first quote from a uh, participant right, saying, despite the fact that science is running, we are doing risk assessment basically like we did it 30 years ago. And a similar view being expressed by the, in the next quote, the way we do safety assessment today is the way we've done it for decades. We're in a world of technology and science that has rapidly progressed to the point where lots of the cars, phones, et cetera, are very different than they were 50 years ago. And our science is not as advanced as it ought to be. All of our investment in technology and science ought to enable us to do this in a way that looks very different from the way we've always done it. And we're not there. And I must say that these views, again, were expressed um, across the board and were, um, in fact, almost more common, common amongst, uh, amongst participants in governance agencies. Um, the fourth uh, challenge that we've identified is that there is a lack of shared understanding of how data becomes evidence for regulatory decisions or for current and future policy regarding chemicals and other potential um, uh, toxins. 
um, a couple of quotes here. Um, that the first quote shows that there's a lack of transparency regarding how data are processed, for example, when we have technologies involved in the processing. The high throughput assays are generally done by private companies with proprietary systems, and even when done in a more open way, the computerized fashion in which the data are collected and analyzed <coughs> prevents much transparency in assessing the data. The second uh, participant, the, uh, or the second quote here, uh, expresses a different view on why there is a lack of transparency. But even beyond that, I think one of the major challenges we face in the regulatory risk assessment context is the unpredictable scientific interpretation that is made of the data. data. We never know in the regulatory context how, I cannot even talk about scientific rigidity, but really which scientific culture will be applied to interpret the data. So it's just not clear how data lead to particular decisions, either because of the way that they are processed or because of the way that they are interpreted. So all of these, uh, these issues are very closely interconnected. Mistrust is both fueled by a lack of shared understandings and fuels it in its turn. turn. The lack of consensus on methods is fueled by an absence of shared understandings and fuels it in its turn. And all of these contribute to the inertia of chemicals regulation and hold the science of regulation back, uh, impeding its progress. So moving on now to our suggestions for getting out of these vicious cycles. What we are after are robust trust practices. So by trust, we might ask, well, because finally, trust holds together human organizations of all kinds, and especially so when one set of people are making decisions that affect the interests of society, economic interests or interests of convenience or well-being and health. But this doesn't mean that what we're advocating is trust on blind faith. Far be it from that. Firstly, there are requirements of transparency for trust. If we imagine a discussion where disagreements are being aired, where there's a disagreement, there are some conditions that, um, that, that need to hold in order for that, that discussion to be a productive one and for trust to be maintained between the different people involved in it. First of all, there are, there are these requirements of transparency, that we need to have information about potential and actual conflicts of interest. What are the motivations of the people involved in the conversation? We also need to, uh, it is also necessary that all of the parties to the discussion should have access to all the relevant information. Access here, meaning that they should be able to obtain the information. Transparency in these forms is, this, is the sine qua non of trust. But we're suggesting that there's space for another aspect of transparency and that transpar transparency should be extended uh, to form a, a form of transparency plus. Aside from practical or logistical access to data and information, we claim that it is necessary to have cognitive access to it. That is that it should be understandable to people coming to it from different backgrounds and perspectives with different interests and concerns. So we need trust practices that balance acceptance and healthy skepticism. Acceptance in being open enough to hear what others say in a disagreement healthy skepticism in being able to question and interrogate. One might even call it curiosity, wanting to get beyond the surface of things. But skepticism, just like belief, has to be based on something. And we've seen in the past two years what happens when skepticism um, is kind of loses some its guardrails. And we've seen the kind of conspiracy theories that that can give rise to. We've seen many examples of those in the last two years. So we need a kind of disciplined skepticism. Um, if discussions, even those where disagreements are aired, are genuinely productive, the parties to the disagreement need at least to be sure they're talking about the same thing. And this is where shared understanding comes to the picture. Importantly here, we don't mean consensus and agreement on the final decision, because there might still be disagreement about that, but at least sufficient shared understanding of how those decisions are made. So how do we build shared understanding? We propose that it's necessary to proactively support building shared understandings in three main areas. Firstly, there is a gap between established methods for toxicity studies and new methods. 
Established methods are usually based on whole organis or organism observational approaches, whereas biosciences generally in the last decades has seen a massive shift towards molecular mechanistic approaches, which has changed the subject in that it has changed not only what the biosciences do, but what they are talking about. For example, it has changed the research questions. There is not a one-one basis for comparison between these. Instead, it is necessary to actively work on the ways in which they can be brought together, uh, to find complementarity so that they can meaningfully be discussed, so that the distance between what they're talking about is not so great. Um, secondly, we need also to understand that data is not evidence, not in and of itself. Of course, data needs to be gathered independently of any specific decision or policy, but it also needs to be gathered in forms that make it able to be used for policy. In the sciences of policy formation, the idea of co-production of sciences and policy is gaining ground. At any rate, we need a constant dialogue between science and policy to ensure that science is able to respond to the needs of policy and policy is able to take up the data of scientific research. And finally, finally, and of course, informing both of these, we need to ensure that the access of Transparency Plus reaches all stakeholders in chemicals regulation. When we, when we say data and evidence are transparent, we always need to ask for whom are they transparent? Meaning, meaning that we can understand them as be, who can, sorry, let me say that again, meaning who can understand them as data for, uh, that informs the evidence for a particular decision or policy. And we need to build in that understandability so that we are not limiting accessibility to any particular group. So this is of particular importance in a domain that is a nexus of so many competing social, economic, and political interests. So all of these are achieved through bridging, bridging across methods, across data, and across evidence, and across stakeholder groups. By building up the grounds for comparison, comparison is the, the staple diet of science. Scientists are always comparing one thing and another. Uh, through seeking connections, points of commonality, similarity, or equivalence. And when they are not there, establishing ways in which they can be built up. Um, looking for ways of integrating data and methods, seeing them as complementary rather than as opposing, but equally looking for bridges in shared problems, questions, values, and interests. On the topic of the AOP framework, um, our study was very informative on how it is perceived in the stakeholder groups, but of particular interest is that the study, study participants themselves expressed the view that it could itself act as a kind of bridging between perspectives, as it provides a common framing for them. So one participant uh, described their own uh, experience um, with a substance that they are, were concerned with. Um, presenting a case to regulators. And actually, uh, this participant said, at that time, we got a recommendation about start from an AOP, something that would be a common mechanism between the different forms of substance X to build your story over there. It would probably facilitate, provide a frame to be more neutral. And another participant, this time from governance, said the following, I think the AOP is the right tool because it's taking all together, using the right data, because you have the hazard, you have the mechanistic, you have the in silico, you have the mathematical, you can really work as a single community. I don't think it's a matter of resistance. I think it's a matter of maturity. So the AOP framework is a knowledge management system and knowledge management plays a key role in building trust in, the, in this domain of chemicals regulation because of the way it both gives access to data um, and frames it so as to support shared understandings in order to achieve this, a knowledge management system needs to meet certain requirements. For example, we, we've claimed that it needs to place validation of test, test methods at the front and center and not as an add-on at the end of the scientific process. Um, it needs to include the forms of data and information about methods that are relevant for stakeholders. It needs to be explicit about how data are produced providing contextualization, making comparisons, equivalences, and connections easy to see, and making visualizations intuitive. Um, 
both of these will be made clearer by um, and in the talks following me by Antonio and, and Jason. But through these means, shared understandings of the reasonings behind data and evidence for decisions and policy are built up. It is possible to have productive discussions. Um, and even if everyone doesn't finally agree, to have the, in these ways, robust forms of trust are supported. So that, thank you for listening. With that, I hand over to Antonio Franco. Antonio is from the Chemical Safety and Alternative Methods Unit of the JRC. Uh, he, support, he is supporting policy initiatives related to data and knowledge management of the EU chemical strategy for sustainability. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Ana Maria. Just sharing my slides. Didn't work, try again. Now it's better. And in presentation mode, there we go. Hi, everyone, and thanks for joining. Um, and thank Ana Maria uh, for the introduction. Indeed, in my presentation, I will share how the management of academic data and knowledge is currently being addressed from an EU policy angle. And the scope of the policy initiative I'm referring to is on academic data. And for those who are familiar um, to the EU policy initiatives uh, and the chemical strategy, this is part of the so-called one substance, one assessment activity. And an increasing component, as we heard, of um, chemical safety science nowadays is on mechanistic data. And, and therefore, the, the title of my talk here is Building Trust Through Improved Tools and Practice in the Life Cycle of Mechanistic Data, to be intended as, a, as an important subset, let's say, of academic data. Now, academic data feed into regulatory assessment processes, and this comes with, among other data sources. And it's often used to fulfill information requirements or to feed into assessments. And typically it complements what we call as standard information requirements. Now, academic data here means every sort of um, hazard, exposure, and risk assessment data derived from studies that are um, published in the scientific literature typically. Um, but they're not carried out specifically to inform a certain regulatory assessment process. And therefore, often they use non standard experimental or computational methods without necessarily complying with the um, recognized quality, quality system. Some do, but not certainly all of them. And when we talk about academic data, as already Anna Maria pointed out, we are all aware of the shift that has happened in this field of research from traditional um, research to more mechanistic data. And therefore, when we talk about academic data and we look into the future, the focus needs to be very much on mechanistic data without, of course, forgetting um, the, the, the value of the existing and future studies that, that keeps on, um, let's say, using, using animal and measuring apical endpoints. Now, where this is coming from, um, in recent years, there's been a series of policy evaluation in the EU um, and uh, a part of that has been addressing, analyzing the way academic data has been used in a regulatory assessment in, in the EU legislative framework. And this exercise um, came with two main conclusions. The first, we need to improve how academic studies are performed and reported in peer-reviewed review, peer literatures in a way that we come closer to regulatory requirements. And the second point is that really we need to improve the implementation of those provisions that are present across legislation in Europe that to consider all available information when carrying out assessments. So these are the two main drivers for the policy initiative on the better use of academic data. Now, one way to understand where issues come from um, is looking at the life cycle of academic data. And um, as you can see here, there's various interest groups involved in the process that goes from the generation of data to their regulatory use through the documentation and the retrieval of data. 
And the first point here is really that this is a, a, a common, a, a, an issue that concerns multiple interest groups. And if you want to make significant steps forward, we need to perceive this as a, as a shared challenge with, with shared responsibility of, of the various steps. And um, the issue here is multiple angles, really. If you start from the data generation, the um, researchers often don't consider regulatory needs when they design and perform studies, that they have no real motivation to, to do so, maybe due to lack of awareness of, of the incentives, of lack of incentives, and also, but also the, um, due to the different differences that do exist across legislation on what is considered um, sufficient criteria for regulatory consideration. And scientific peer-reviewed studies often are not documented in a way that satisfied um, regulators. And also many academic data don't really follow what we call the fair data principle of findability, accessibility, interoperability, and reusability. And authorities and registrants therefore kind of lack the tools that bring together and monitor relevant academic data as they become available. And in addition, not all of scientific output is open access. And that raises a question whether that sort of information is considered available or not. So this leads to a situation where regulators don't really have the means to enforce those provisions that require considering all available data, data including academic data, and also to some significant differences in, in the way the issue is tackled um, by agencies and scientific committees in, in, in the level of expectations and criteria applied for consideration of academic data. Now I'm taking I'm talking about this as purely as a data management and, and data knowledge management problem, as we are aware that also conventional assessment methodologies that are implemented in, in legislation really struggle to take full advantage of modern toxicology and exposure assessment approaches. But that's a broader, a broader, ob obviously and very relevant topic. But I will focus on the data knowledge management aspect here. A few examples from REACH and in the way that, uh, that illustrate how academic data are, are used in rich processes, um, very much in, to fulfill information requirements. It are considered, let's say, equivalent to standard information requirement, but also increasingly so um, as evidence supporting read across in adaptations to standard information requirements and various types of what we call mechanistic data come into play here increasingly. We then have what, um, it's called the assessment of regulatory needs. That is a process that, that ECA performs to sort of a screen and streamline um, assessments of often big substance groups to identify regulatory needs. Um, an example there is the screening for endocrine disruptors, which very much uses um, data streams coming, for example, from ToxCast or the um, US EPA ED screening program. And all these data is, is um, much of that data at least is published in, in peer reviewed literature. If we look at restrictions in REACH, here there's been um, a very recent and actually yet unpublished study um, that analyzed the provenance of key studies in REACH restrictions. And, and here, very kindly, the authors of this work have shared with me um, some early results of this work, which I'm, which I'm illustrating here. Um, two key outcomes of this analysis is that non-standard studies actually comprise the majority of key studies in reach restrictions. And that is basically academic data coming from peer-reviewed literature. Most of that is open access, but a substantial fraction um, requires a fee to access. And about one third of these data so key studies used in restrictions were not including in rich registration dossiers. That means that um, member states in this case would have needed to expand the, 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 the database available to support the, the, the restriction dossier with external data. And again here, many of these non-standard studies. Now, academic data are clearly an essential component of assessments. But there are important obstacles in how we, um, we use them. And the Commission started a policy action, as I said, under the chemical strategy to address the two key needs that I highlighted before. And the first task we did in this, um, in this activity is to map the resources that are available to researchers and assessors to improve how we produce, document, access, and use academic data. 
And this list includes various um, guidance and standards and tools. And we started to map how these tools and guidance can help um, in improving the different steps along the life cycle um, of academic data. So now, this is an initial list of resources developed at OECD level. You can see there the AOP framework, um, but also various guidance and reporting standards for key data streams. Um, the list continues with what we call resources that are available, made available by EU institutions and agencies. And among this list, perhaps, I'm not going into detail of each one, um, but um, a particular notice is the work done by EFSA um, towards, um, towards streamlining systematic reviews and guidance to do systematic reviews, which is very relevant for our activity here. Um, there's also um, important standards, tools, and guidance coming from other international organizations, and I'll just list a few of them here, probably. Um, they cover guidelines on planning and reporting health research, so human data, um, similar guidance for um, designing and reporting animal studies. Very important, of course, public and commercial search engines that are used when you perform um, literature reviews. And other examples of databases and tools, including the Wiki Pharma and the Wiki Reach concepts developed by Stockholm University, which is sort of an, ex an exploration of the, an attempt to um, put in a database, in a comprehensive database, um, data coming from academics that can support reach processes. And a lot is going on also in the US, of course, in the Comtox database, an example, also the tools there for systematic reviews. Um, this is all great, of course, and um, many of these are useful and are being used by the various um, actors of, of, the, of, the, of the policy framework. But, but the problem here is that, that these are not as, you, as much used as, as we hope. And, and from, the scientist, from a scientist point of view, the point is that they, scientists don't really um, get excited when it comes to following guidance and filling templates frankly said. And perhaps we, they lack the, the incentives to do this. Perhaps it's a lack of awareness. So our proposition here goes in two directions. Um, if you look at the first half, the, the top half of, of, the, of the life cycle of academic data, we want to target a bit this, um, the, the community of scientists and to develop a generic guidance, an overarching guidance that, that aims at setting minimum quality requirements and reporting requirements. This is really um, designed to help researchers to perform and report studies, and it should be broad in scope, so not on specific types of data, but more in uh, overarching type of guidance. But it should just really um, be used as an entry point for academics to identify what the requirements and what the existing um, resources are. And it should build on the existing resources because these are, um, these are obviously an excellent starting point. And then it, it should be the generic, uh, a generic uh, based on generic concepts, but then providing pointers to specific quality documents where they exist. And perhaps equally, if not more important of the guidance, we need to highlight the benefits for data generators to implement the guidance. And, and here we are exploring options to develop editorials or founders policy to encourage the implementation of such requirements. The second directions we are looking at is um, targeting the, the bottom half of the, of the, of the um, data life cycle. And this is targeting um, assessors and trying to, to provide something that helps them to implement the requirements to consider all available information. So this is something to help assessors to find and access and evaluate academic data from scientific sources. Again, it builds on established tools and practice. And the solutions we're looking into include predefined search and screen criteria, possibly automated solutions, including study repositories and alerts, open access platform, databases in harmonized formats, knowledge bases, and of course, policy mechanisms to implement um, this, this guide. Now looking at some different options we are exploring, um, we're working at different levels here because you can tackle this at different levels. At the level of guidance to start with, 
Um, we have the extra guidance on systematic reviews that very much sets a standard, at least in Europe. But this is very resource intensive and perhaps it's not applicable as such to other policy domains. So maybe something like a search tool that lists the various repositories of studies and structured data and knowledge could be also of added value here. If you look at the level then of repositories of academic studies, this is also an option that we are considering. This is a collection of academic studies that fulfills certain, certain relevance and quality criteria. Um, it could be based on predefined criteria, um, but it all could be also be the outcome of systematic reviews performed by assessors and populated in these ways. Um, and scientists and scientific community could also play a role in, in populating such a repository. And this is just a screenshot from um, a recent mock-up studies that the commission have done in the context of the common data platform on chemicals. Now, at the highest level, let's say, of, of hierarchy of these options, we have structured data and knowledge management tools. And um, this includes substance databases, but also linking to test method databases and also a strong knowledge base on biological pathways leading to adverse effects, that is the um, adverse outcome pathways framework. And the ambition here is really to find some smart ways to link the three elements of this triangle. So test methods, substance data as an entry point for assessors that are interested in substance data, but then the link to test methods and to the knowledge, very importantly, that justify why we are generating this data and how we integrate this data. So we really see the AOP as a well-suited framework to facilitate the integration of various um, types of data, of data streams and um, very much relating to the outcomes of the study report by Anna Maria and co-authors, really a tool to facilitate the contextualization through comparisons and equivalences. And this leads me to the next presentation, which will be by Jason O'Brien. Um, Jason is a molecular ecotoxicologist at Environment and Climate Change Canada, and he supports in various roles the AOP framework. And he will tell us much more about the role of AOP framework in knowledge management and trust building. Let me share my screen. All right, thank you very much, uh, Anna Maria and Antonio for those, uh, for those talks to set me up here. Uh, my name is Jason O'Brien. I'm a molecular ecotoxicologist for Environment and Climate Change Canada. I'm also involved in various um, activities around AOPs, including developing uh, guidance documentation for AOPs and the IT implementation of the AOP knowledge base. And I'm going to be telling you a little bit, I'll give you a little bit more background on what the AOP framework is with some focus on some of the trust building aspects and talk about how the AOPs address some of the recommendations in the report that uh, Anna Maria discussed in her first presentation, uh, AOPs, knowledge management and trust building. So some of the, the usual preamble, there's a global pressure to increase the efficiency of chemical risk assessment and reduce the reliance on animal based tests. And one of the proposed solutions is through the use of the so called new approach methodologies, and this includes um, in silico, in chemical, and in vitro assays, as well as some high throughput and high content methods like the genomics tools, as well as some informatic methods like toxicokinetic and toxicodynamic modeling. Now, one of the major challenges for the regulatory adoption of these NAMs is interpreting their human and environmental health relevance. What exactly is the relationship between the output of a NAM test and an actual health outcome, and how strong is the evidence of this relationship? It's somewhat analogous to uh, going to a doctor and getting a medical test done. If you were to get the results from your blood work back and just get the spreadsheet with the, with the data on there, it's hard to understand what this means to, to your own life. Uh, you need a doctor to help explain what exactly is the health relevance of these measurements and what it means to you. And so that's kind of the role of the AOP framework. The goal of the AOP framework is to establish and communicate the health relevance of new approach methodologies and uh, virtually any other biological measurement as well, um, with the ultimate goal of trying to uh, support the use of NAMs in, in risk assessments. Now, this 
sentence is a bit of a mouthful, but I hope it becomes a little more clear uh, as, I, as I go through my presentation. But the AOP framework is a knowledge management framework to aggregate and evaluate evidence for causal relationships between what we can measure and health outcomes of regulatory concern. Now, the, the structure of the framework is based on two major um, components. The first component are these key events, which are represented by these boxes in this box and arrow diagram. And the key events uh, represent the things that we can measure. Um, each AOP is bookended by two special types of key events. On one end is the molecular initiating event. This represents where uh, a measurable event where a chemical first interacts with biology at the molecular level. And this initiates a series of uh, chain, a chain of key events that ultimately lead to uh, the apical effect or the adverse outcome, which is a, an endpoint uh, of, of human or, or health, uh, human health or ecological health of regulatory importance. Now, key events uh, tend to progress through uh, levels of biological organization as we move uh, from the beginning of the AOP towards the end. Uh, we can have um, molecular, organelle, cellular tissue, organ, organism, and population effects that can be um, described in these key events. And the kind of uh, data that informs these key events comes from a variety of sources, including in chemico and silico, in vitro tests for some of these lower levels of biological organization, and in vivo and epidemiological studies for the higher order biological information. So this is all about the uh, key events, the things that we can measure. But another, the other important component of AOPs that often gets overlooked by newcomers to, to AOPs are the key event relationships. And the key event relationships is where the evidence of the causal relationship between the things that we can measure is documented. Now the key events, the key event relationships are really the, the workhorse of the AOP framework. This is where AOPs convert data into evidence. Um, key event relationships collect data from a variety of different sources that can be complex and dispersed throughout, uh, mostly through the uh, scientific literature. And it condenses and converts all of that data into evidence. And it does that using two primary methods. Um, the first is the modified Bradford Hill criteria for causality. And this is a set of criteria where you organize all of this dispersed data uh, into criteria for evaluating the statement, A causes B. And these criteria are based on rules of uh, biological plausibility, uh, meaning how well do we understand the biological system, and also uh, on empirical evidence. What is the um, experimental uh, evidence that we have to support this relationship? And the other is a weight of evidence evaluation. Um, during the, the, this evaluation, uh, multiple lines of evidence are assessed against this hypothesis of causality. And the weight of evidence is based on criteria for data quality and the strength of this causal linkage. Um, so in a, in a very brief nutshell, this is kind of the, the general structure of an AOP. The things that we can measure are the key events and the evidence for a relationship between these things are the key event relationships. So now that we have our AOPs, um, what can we do with them? Well, there's a lot of different things we can do. They, they're very useful research support tools, but one of the primary goals of the AOP is to support risk assessment. Now, AOPs themselves are not risk assessments. Um, uh, they're not kind of the, the magic bullet to solve all of these problems that um, Maria was talking about, but they are an important tool that can help support some of these, uh, these problems, addressing some of these problems. And uh, they are made, they're meant to be coupled with uh, other tools like risk assessment frameworks, such as the IATA framework. And this is, if you're unfamiliar with it, this is integrated approaches to testing and assessment. And this is a cyclic process um, of gathering information and weighing uh, the collective evidence and going through that process over and over until you have enough evidence to make a, a confident regulatory conclusion about the safety of a, chem a chemical. And AOPs are very well suited to support many of the steps of the IATA process. And I don't have enough time to go into detail about how this is done, but if you are interested, I highly recommend 
you uh, check out this uh, guidance document released by the OECD on how exactly AOPs can be used um, in a variety of different risk assessment scenarios uh, through the IATA framework. Um, so we know a little bit more about what the AOP framework is and how it can be used. And now I want to talk to you a little bit about the actual uh, program that is implemented by the OECD. This is the implementation of the actual framework. Now, the hub of the, of the OECD's AOP program is the AOP Wiki. This is an online repository of, of AOP knowledge. This is where all of that information about the things that we can measure and the relationship between the things that we measure are documented and shared. Um, all There's AOP pages, key event pages, key event relationship pages, where all this information is. And because of the uh, wiki structure, um, of the wiki format of the AOP wiki, um, this allows collaborative development of AOPs. People can work together um, to build and, and collect all of this evidence together, and this can be done uh, by collaborators all over the world. And this information is open and free to all. Um, you don't need anything to see the information. If you want to contribute, there's a very simple and free registration process. The program also includes some uh, guidance and support. There is a, uh, a handbook with very detailed guidance on how to actually build uh, AOPs. Um, the wiki also includes some uh, online support like frequently asked questions, a discussion forum, and, and other forms of support. And there's a coaching program where experienced AOP developers can uh, share their experience with uh, people that are new to AOPs. And finally, when AOPs have uh, finished the cycle of development, there is a review and endorsement process. Um, this involves a compliance review where the AOPs are first checked to make sure that they meet the technical um, requirements of an AOP. And then uh, it's passed off to a scientific review where the scientific content is uh, subject to a peer review by subject matter experts. And then once the scientific review is completed, um, the OECD can endorse uh, the AOP, indicating that they support the process by which AO the AOP was developed. And this review and endorsement process is completely transparent and, and open. Um, all of the names of the authors and the reviewers, as well as uh, any review comments and response to reviewer comments are all made public. Um, any um, conflicts of interest, um, if there are any present, are made public, and all of this is communicated via the wiki. And this process, because it's all completely open and, and largely centered around the wiki, can be collaborative. Um, reviewers and uh, authors can openly discuss some of the issues that they have either through, through the wiki or they can even uh, hold meetings. And now as the program grows, um, the AOP is also, uh, OECD has also uh, formed partnerships with some journals to help uh, support some of this uh, review process. So two recent uh, signees of a, a memorandum of understanding with the OECD are the journal Environmental Toxicology and Chemistry and Environmental and Molecular Mutagenesis. And so they now have the ability to conduct uh, AOP reviews according to this open process as described by the OECD. So quick recap of, of all of that, um, a, AOP framework is a knowledge management framework. Um, it's for the documentation of causal evidence between biological measurements and how they're relevant to adverse effects of regulatory concern, ultimately with the goal of, of supporting the use of new approach methodologies in risk assessment. Um, it's, a, it's a tool to support risk assessment and, and research. And there is the, the uh, OECD's program is the implementation of this framework, which involves the AOP Wiki, some support and a peer review process. But now uh, I wanna talk to you about uh, the things that Anna Maria and Antonio discussed in, in their presentations and how the AOP framework can address some of the, the issues um, and uh, re regarding uh, trust building. And as I do this, I'm gonna talk about uh, how the program currently addresses it. Uh, right now, um, the program, it's kind of, the evolution of the program is kind of in line with the evolution of the wiki. Right now, the wiki is at version 2.4. And I'm gonna tell you about how we plan to address some of these issues in future versions of the wiki. We hope to release version 3.0 in a couple of years or so. And as a quick recap of what Anna Maria was talking about, um, there was, there was uh, many recommendations in this uh, report about how this uh, knowledge infrastructure can help build trust. And I won't be able to go into all of these in, in very much detail, but I hope to touch on some of the more um, important ones that the AOP framework addresses. 
So uh, firstly, um, Anna Maria discussed the concept of, of bridging and bridging consists of making connections between different approaches or methods by highlighting existing connections or by forging new ones. In the report, she uh, highlights two main areas where bridging is needed. She discussed this in her report as well in her presentation. Um, the need to uh, bridge between established toxicity tests and new methods and mechanisms. And as I already mentioned, this is the primary goal of the AOP framework to establish the what the uh, establish and communicate the causal relationships between um, endpoints of regulatory concern, which are usually quantified by these established tests. Um, though she also discussed some of the problems with using these as the so-called gold standard and uh, linking these to new approach methodologies. Another area uh, of uh, bridging that's needed is between data and evidence. And I already talked to you about how uh, the AOP framework formally collects data and converts that um, data into evidence in a very transparent uh, and hopefully <laughs> understandable fashion. And this brings us to the ideas of, of transparency uh, and transparency plus. Uh, Anna Maria uh, highlighted three um, different aspects that are required to, to meet transparency plus. The first is access to all relevant information by all parties. And because of the wiki and the open access format to this information, um, the AOP program uh, certainly meets this requirement. The declaration of potential conflicts of interest is also met um, because the review process that we have is open and transparent. All conflicts are, are made of, uh, open to the public. But in order to meet transparency plus, there's a requirement to make explicit the reasoning behind the knowledge management system. And uh, again, part of this is achieved by the transparency by which we collect data and convert it into evidence, but there are some, some room for improvement. Um, we, we are now exploring how to, we can adopt more systematic approaches into not only describing how the data are converted into evidence, but also describing how the data and why the data are collected in the way that they are. And we also want to improve the way that we deliver this information um, to the, the end users. So we want to enhance the annotation uh, to make it uh, not only uh, apparent uh, what the evidence is, but you can get your hands on it and manipulate it yourself and, and use it for your own purposes. So these are some improvements that we want to make in uh, AOP uh, future versions of the wiki. Anna Maria talks about the importance of the user-centric design. And to date, admittedly, the AOP program and the wiki have been largely targeted towards AOP developers. And this was a necessity um, because the priority was generating content. Um, at the beginning, we didn't have any AOP, so we needed to focus on development. This graph shows the growth of the, of the knowledge uh, base over, over time. We're at a pace of about 50 AO, new AOPs per year in the, in the AOP wiki. And so now that we have started to uh, get this base of AOP knowledge, uh, our next steps will be focused on targeting the user experience towards knowledge consumers. And we have a few plans in order to do that. We want to improve the data structure to make uh, the information in the wiki follow the FAIR principles a little bit better. It needs to be more findable. Um, searching for information in the wiki right now is not the easiest thing in the world. We want to make it more interoperable so you can collect the information and use it for your own needs and transfer it to other programs a little more easy and improve the transparency and communication, where the information came from, what are the references, and so on. And we also want to improve uh, visual aspects of, of interacting with AOP information. And that brings me to the next step that was brought up in the report. There's a section on intuitive visualization. And so there's a strong appetite for visual rending of knowledge to make it more digestible. Um, it only takes our brains a fraction of a second to process a, a visual uh, rendering of, of a scene or some, of some information, whereas it takes our much longer to process this information if it's delivered in text. And so this is a very, very, very important form of, of communicating knowledge. And it's an inter intermediate role between perspectives and allowing productive discussions and ultimately how, how agreements can be met. And so because they play such a pivotal role, pivotal role um, the design of the visual aspects of a knowledge management system is extremely important. Um, the report uh, discusses many different aspects of visualization. Uh, one example that's given is the common problem that AOPs are frequently mistaken as representing biological pathways. 
instead of what they really are, which is a knowledge management framework. And so the report suggests that this might be due to some of the visualizations that we use in the AOP framework. For example, this traditional box and arrow diagram might need to be revisited because these can deflect from the real value of the framework. Um, so it's important to disambiguate um, between the biological aspects and the knowledge management aspects of the AOP framework. And one of the things that we are planning to do to address this is uh, we've already started to organize focus groups on visualization of AOPs. We're holding these meetings um, across um, uh, different areas in, in the uh, EU and in North, in North America. And we're going to examine how users interact with the visual representations of AOPs. And we're hoping to use this information to help um, do some upgrades to the visual aspects of, of the wiki and the program. The report talks about the importance of methods. The lack of consensus regarding methods for obtaining uh, data can lead to disagreements about the trustworthiness of the data. And in the report, they recommend that methods become have a more explicit role. And while methods are currently um, documented in, in the wiki, each key event has a section called how is it measured, which describes the methods. Um, our intention in future uh, versions is to make the, the role of methods much more explicit. We want to create a new data object in uh, for four methods where we can uh, uh, collect much more relevant information. For example, what is the validation status of the different methods? What is the availability of the methods and, and any guidelines available? We can link to any relevant databases, for example, the TSAR database that Antonio talked about. And this brings us to the point of validation, which uh, Anna Maria says is one of the most uh, important aspects of gaining trust in NAMS. Uh, validation um, is the gatekeeper of acceptance, is what is said in the report. And it's the main obstacle uh, to the adoption of new uh, methods. And so uh, the report recommends that validation should be placed front and center of knowledge management. I hope my animation's a little out of sync here. But, uh, and method validation doesn't really play a prominent role in the AOP uh, framework or the AOP wiki at the moment. There are some aspects, peer review and endorsement by, by the OECD are forms of validation that are already in the AOP framework, but method validation uh, needs to be made more explicit. And um, how exactly this can be done needs to be investigated a little more. One excellent example, though, is the, uh, skin, the new skin sensitization test guideline that's been developed based on an AOP. It's a testing approach that is based on AOPs that uses uh, three different uh, assays in silico and chemical or in vitro assays to determine whether a chemical is a skin sensitizer. It uses multiple key events um, to determine uh, the effect. And this has been validated against uh, animal and human data. And the conclusion was that um, when these three assays are combined, it provides the same or more information than the equivalent animal test. So this is an excellent example of an AOP approach to validation. So we need to investigate how the, the framework can support this kind of thing better. Um, one of the final points in the report is how um, the knowledge uh, management uh, framework needs to be a point of continuity in education, collaboration, and engagement. And I, I hope you can see that the AOP framework uh, already excels in these areas. Um, one thing that may not be apparent is the education. We have an education, training, and outreach subgroup subgroup that specializes in, in uh, developing training materials and uh, outreach communication for AOPs. Um, we're also seeing some programs specific to AOPs up here in university programs. I've already talked about uh, how the wiki is a hub for collaboration, and there's many successful cross-disciplinary uh, examples of collaboration, but there is room for improvement. Um, there are some barriers to participation, and we hope to alleviate some of these in future uh, versions. And uh, finally, engagement. Uh, we have to actively and deliberately get participation from the public. And we've already started to, like the, the AOP visualization focus groups, we're hoping to engage stakeholders um, and as we move forward with this user-centric design of the AOP framework. And so that's a very quick uh, look at all of the different recommendations that, uh, and, uh, that have been made in this in report. And uh, so I, I'm, I'm sure we'll discuss this in a lot more detail in the, in the discussion period. Thank you. Okay, 
Thank you very much, Jason. Thank you all uh, for the excellent presentations. Uh, I think uh, we are left for uh, 20 minutes uh, for some uh, discussions. And uh, thank you very much for sending in uh, um, your questions. So uh, together with uh, Clemens, uh, we'll try to, to moderate uh, the discussion. Um, and please, to the panelists, please uh, turn on your cameras and uh, uh, microphones and, um, and le let's get started. Yes, let's do that. Uh, uh, one question maybe immediately because it uh, relies, uh, relates to one of the last slides that Jason showed, but has also much to do with um, chemical information requirements. Uh, Sam Saunders asked us, in the context of REACH, how does the JSC or others foresee AOPs being integrated into information requirements? Would registrants use the AOP framework or do you see it more as a tool for the regulators to use in evaluating submitted information? I think this connection uh, of AOPs via IATAS and defined approaches leading to chemical uh, uh, risk assessment. I think that's a very, very, it's, it's, it's a, at the center of, of this whole uh, discussion here. Maybe either Antonio or Jason, you can say something about that. I think you kind of uh, touched on what I was thinking. Um, in cases where certain like specific IATAs or defined approaches have been developed, um, it's quite clear how, how the AOP um, structure can, can kind of help decide which uh, kind of information. Um, but I think uh, IATAs are also generally flexible. There's the defined uh, approaches like the skin sensitization one, but the general approach is also flexible. And so, yeah, it would be um, interesting to see how that kind of philosophy can be adopted into actual risk assessment programs, for sure. Yeah, just maybe just to complement that indeed the assessment of relevance of the available data as part of a dossier is, is, is a task that, sub, that, that registrants have and therefore having the, the AOP, um, I can see a role there in understanding the relevance and the integration and comparison of all the data package you have at hand. So registrants as well as evaluators, um, ev yeah, evaluators, um, regulatory, let's say agencies um, to enable them to then assess the relevance again of what has been submitted and submitted as the, the most important suit of um, data sets. Yeah, maybe Clemens uh, also, I have a, a question to, to address, uh, uh, I mean, to Jason, but to, to all also. Um, uh, there's a question about uh, balance, uh, how we balance the desire uh, of, um, for scientific knowledge uh, uh, versus uh, this um, um, yeah, intention sometimes uh, uh, that we want uh, uh, this, it's human based, uh, that we want to, to measure everything uh, because uh, they are described in an AOP. And the thing, the, the trigger for the, from this uh, uh, is coming uh, from the European skin sensitization, where we have multiple uh, assays uh, for uh, uh, all the key events in, in the AOP. So any reflections on that? Yeah, this is a, a constant battle that we have with, with AOP developers, because generally the AOP developers are scientists um, from academia often. And uh, they want to understand all of the intricacies of the, the biological mechanisms and try to develop individual key events for every little thing that they could possibly measure. And um, so I, I call this the battle of the lumpers and the splitters. Um, they're the splitters who try to take a key event and break it up into every single possible measurement possible, and the lumpers who try to keep it as maybe overly simple. And, and I think the answer is somewhere in, in between. But as a general rule of thumb, um, we try to encourage AOP developers uh, to focus on things that can be measured on a, as a more in a kind of regulatory context, something that can be, uh, you know, as a, as a regular uh, test or a standard test. And th that is where the, the strength of the AOP framework um, is. It, of course, it, it can be used also. Some, the scientific community is latching onto this because the, the causal relationship establishment is extremely powerful for as a research tool. So 
again, it's a battle between using it as a research tool and using it for risk assessment. I don't think it's a bad thing. <laughs> Thank you. Clemens, do you have a, a question? Yes, um, I saw an interest. I mean, all the questions are interesting and really great. We have already 27 questions. Thank you for that. And uh, I think, uh, by the way, if we cannot answer them to, in today's meeting, we will address them in written. Is that correct? At least in past webinars, that was the case. So you will get an answer, maybe not immediately, but you will get one. Uh, either live uh, by answered by panelists or via the um, uh, answered box in, in this Q&A box or written later. So there, there, there was one uh, question um, from Anne Gourmelon, uh, which is actually quite at the center of the whole uh, meeting to all of the speakers. What would you recommend as a first immediate follow-up action to address this trust crisis? So when we all go away from this webinar, what should we do? Either either panelist can can answer. Well, I can I can start. I throw my stone. Um, I think founders, research founders, had a big responsibility um, in in making sure what they fund meets the need of regulation. And therefore, so far, at least EU funded research. Uh, latches to the open science, the, what we call the EU open science policy, which are very generic statements about um, fair data, interoperability, open access, and, and these sort of things. But there's the next level that is the, the scientific domain specific requirements that you can, um, to some extent, you can require scientists to fulfill. Um, and therefore, submitting, a, you know, publishing your research in a paper and not bothering about how that relates to existing knowledge, existing knowledge bases, existing databases, and get your data lost there in the ocean of academic literature is just not enough. And I think founders have a big role to play there. Um, and if I can come in there, I would agree with Antonio. I think that funders have a huge role to play as they always do because they're the strongest shapers of science policy. Um, so yes, we need to speak to our funders and we need to make sure that they're having the policies that are necessary. Um, but I do think that we need also, as, as we've suggested, to think about how knowledge is um, every time that we are putting out information about um, chemicals, we need to think about uh, how it is framed and who can access this and um, you know, it's starting out with self-reflection when we are publishing, um, and what avenues we are using for publishing, and uh, and in knowledge management, as we have suggested, this plays an important role. So there isn't a silver bullet. There's, in, in particular, not anything fast that can happen. But um, I think that that ensuring that they are not sort of data dumps. <laughs> but that data is properly contextualized is the most important thing that we can do. And in particular thinking of who needs to understand these data. Yeah, I think the, the challenges uh, with, with trust in science are very far reaching and there's many different aspects that, that can be addressed. Funding, definitely uh, data and context, very important issues. And another one that has, has come up um, is the um, what's what's the right term? But the the motivation for scientists for doing the research, which is related to research, but um, publication um, as the the primary um, measure of of a scientist's success um, needs to be somehow addressed. Um, the, the volume of work that's coming out of science, in some ways, is a good thing, but in some ways is a bad thing. Um, the, the the quality of of some of the the studies that is coming out. Um, quality over quantity needs to be um, be featured. And so some of the, this can be addressed by, by funders and also by making sure that when you're generating data that the, the context um, is taken into consideration. So I think it's a very, very important aspect as well. Okay, thank you. 
I think something related to that is what Jacques Trollet wrote, a very interesting remark, uh, and also in a, a question. Uh, uh, actually, Jacques uh, sub, uh, submitted a series of questions. I, I found all of them very interesting, but let's focus on this one. The issue is that we do not train regulatory scientists. We have regulatory scientists, applied scientists, and fundamental scientists, but the regular and the fundamental ones and the applied ones are trained. There are training uh, routes or pathways for those, but there is no training for regulatory science. And then Shark writes, uh, we therefore use either the applied scientist or the fundamental scientist as a regulatory scientist, and those will complain their lifetimes about how boring their life is. Do you have any comments on, on how we can address the lack of really trained regulatory scientists? Uh, well, perhaps I can come in here because it's, uh, this question of education and training is a particular hobby horse of mine in a particular uh, a uh, passion of, of mine. I, I, I uh, think that indeed many of the issues that we face, not only in chemicals re regulation, but more broadly, many of the issues that we face all come down to uh, education and training, which is too narrow, which puts people in boxes, which they can then uh, not think themselves out of. And I think, yes, that indeed um, we would need, we need a very different approach to education and training. Uh, and that indeed is a very large and fundamental cha challenge. And basically, we are trying to fix things that um, are put in place as people are being educated, uh, much, much too narrowly, um, in particular disciplines, in particular methods, in the particular approaches, without any view to what is beyond, what, what lies beyond. And um, in this respect, I would... Um, I would say again what I often say, there is no reason in the world why our natural world or our social and economic world is neatly divided into the departments of a university uh, or of technical colleges. Um, these problems are complex and they need this complexity to be recognized in, in education that doesn't start off by putting people into boxes. Thank you. I mean, if there's no any follow up, uh, I will combine some uh, <laughs> some questions which, which they, they have to do about the application um, of uh, AOPs. Um, and uh, I mean, how or oh, maybe we envision uh, using them. Uh, I know um, uh, Jason, through his presentation, indicated that uh, um, uh, through IATA is uh, a possible um, uh, path uh, to, to do so. But maybe there are some some more. So so they're asking uh, if uh, they could be like, for example, um, uh, integrated uh, in information requirements that uh, would uh, registrants uh, could use. Uh, um, they ask for quantitative uh, or AOPs. Um, and uh, yeah, like, uh, or maybe as a tool for, uh, for the regulators only to use in evalu evaluating submitting information. So I don't know if you have any reflections on, on that. Yeah, I don't know, Jason, maybe he's going to you or maybe I can. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure if I fully understand the question. Um, okay. uh, sorry, it's about application of uh, AOPs and also about uh, quantitative AOPs. Um, yeah, qu quantitative, I can talk a little bit about quantitative AOPs. Um, they're kind of the the holy grail of the AOP process is um, can we collect enough data and understanding of the relationships between all the things that we can measure uh, such that if we measure one, we can predict the outcomes um, given that we have all of the necessary information. Now, this is extremely ambitious and it, there's only a few examples where this is 
has, has been uh, achieved to, to any de degree. I think this is the, the long-term goal of the, the program, and I don't think it is something we can expect uh, in the very near future. Um, but, you know, ultimately that's what we're, we're striving towards. Uh, right now, um, the main goal is to establish uh, some kind of um, relationship um, and, and confidence in the relationship between the measured endpoints and a, and a health outcome such that the data can be considered in an integrated um, uh, approach. So Environment Canada, for example, um, will consider uh, data from new approach methodologies, but it doesn't use only data from new approach methodologies. It, it takes a weight of evidence approach and considers various lines of evidence. And NAMs aren't really the driving factor in, in most risk assessments. They're kind of accessory or, or supportive information at the moment. I think as we get more quantitative understanding, NAMs will become more central to the, to the risk assessment uh, calculations. Thank you, Jason. Uh, maybe two uh, two questions that have been asked uh, one after the other, which are actually going into different directions. Alison Connolly asked, another solution to finding academic data would have to be a specific keyword for relevant studies. I, I think that goes into uh, findable, findability in the, in the FAIR uh, spectrum. While Haley Holnagel immediately afterward asked, did you examine if indeed searchability or findability of academic data is a relevant roadblock for the use? I find them simple to find, but then extremely difficult to assess for relevance. So there is a conflicting opinion about the findability of academic data. And, and then after, when you found them, what then? What do you do with them? Any opinions on that? Maybe, I don't know, Antonio, you brought up the usability of academic data. Yeah, I think, I mean, I, I, I tend to see the problem as, as more of a, of a um, the, the assessing the relevance problem rather than accessing it by itself. But it all depends what you when you consider your the step of retrieving information done and you go into assessing relevance because you can you can you can design very simple search criteria let's say you can go out in you know pubmed of google scholar and and design a very simple search criteria very encompassing and then you have thousands of papers and you need to assess them for relevance that's a very long exercise or you can apply more sophisticated and iterative approaches to searches and then that then becomes more more difficult um and more yeah uh, resource intensive but i think it, it is mainly a problem of assessing relevance and less so perhaps of um of, of findability although if a, a subset of papers and indeed some key studies are difficult to access because there's a fee barrier or something then it's a perfect excuse you know to say well we cannot do that and therefore removing that is absolutely crucial One, so the, I'm only talking in the context of AOPs, and then the, the specific applications for risk assessment are uh, will, will be something that needs to be addressed afterwards. But one of the nice things about the AOP framework is that there are there is a means to to uh, assess relevance when you're collecting data, and um, <clears throat> uh, we're starting to try to, like I mentioned in the presentation, we're trying to incorporate more systematic methods because you're right, it is easy, easy-ish to find words based on uh, studies based on searches. But sometimes when you do certain searches, you'll get thousands of, of, of results in your search and assessing the relevance of that is a, is a challenge and, and keeping uh, clear and transparent documentation of how you assess that is kind of the realm of the systematic review. And we're trying to incorporate those kind of approaches into AOP knowledge collection. And but the nice thing about the AOP framework is there is a way um, to assess the, the relevance. Doing this uh, at the scale needed to uh, to address the thousands of, of scientific journals out there is a major challenge and something we're looking into. But uh, I'd say that's one of the nice things. So may, maybe, and, and I know some risk assessments definitely have some criteria of assessing quality. Um, in order to include a paper in, in a study, but assessing the relevance might be where the AOPs can help. Thank you, Jason. I don't know, Clement, uh, do, you, do you have anything from there or Salai? 
ask a question. Oh, you're muted. Yeah. Okay. I just saw that uh, there was a question from. Um, no, no, it's gone away. Uh, there was a question, uh, and I think Anna Marie is already uh, answering it uh, in the chat, in the in the in the type box. It's a question uh, when when you when you Anna Maria showed the slide of the user of the uh, user communities that should be. Um, addressed by the AOP framework, a regulatory scientists, regulator, um, uh, uh, risk assessors, risk managers. Uh, the, uh, the, the person who asked the question, I don't find it right now, asked, shouldn't we also include academia and academia in, 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 in this as, as, as a fourth group? And I think the answer is obviously yes. We just, uh, in the study that we uh, executed, uh, this group was not directly targeted, but obviously the AOP framework as as the, the, the person who asked the questions uh, rightly said, so it's a very useful framework also for um, having students assemble knowledge in, in a coherent fashion. So yes, obviously the, the AOP framework um, is not limited to the three target audiences that Anna Maria showed in her, her slide. Uh, could I just add to that, Clemens, that that is also, uh, so this, this study was focused on these particular users because the earlier studies had focused uh, on academics and developers, and there is the paper which I've linked to in the uh, answer session where we analyze all the stakeholder groups and academics are, are definitely there. And there's a much broader range of stakeholder groups in the earlier paper. And, uh, and it's just that in this particular study, we focused on, on those users. I totally like uh, Sam Saunders' last remark, uh, saying that uh, when you um, assess your annual impact, when you have to write your annual impact report as a, as a scientist, we, for example, here at the GSE have to do that. He suggests it would be so simple to include development of a contribution to an AOP as a category of impact. And I think this is a, a really good idea and would um, definitely increase the visibility and, uh, and the, the relevance of the AOP framework for the scientific community. Yeah. Okay, I think uh, we are close to two. 30 central european time maybe yeah i don't know if there are any final remarks from uh, from the panelists uh, otherwise i will go ahead and <laughs> and uh, close this uh, webinar i mean thank you very much for all these questions <laughs> Uh, it's been a, a challenge uh, actually uh, going through them, uh, uh, but uh, we we haven't managed to address them all. So we'll be back uh, with you, you know, providing answers to to, to these um, questions. Uh, for for the time being, uh, thank you uh, for participating uh, and uh, contributing to this uh, nice webinar. An enormous thank to our uh, experts for presenting and uh, uh, answering uh, these uh, challenging uh, questions today. And many thanks to our assistants and technical staff for helping us to have a very smooth webinar. So thank you very much. Bye bye.